What makes a great story? How do you craft a story so beautiful that it remains remembered throughout the ages? These are questions I've been trying to answer for myself since I was a small child. My current answer is that a great story is one I can fully immerse myself in, relate to the characters on an emotional level, jump into their minds and imagine myself within their realities. Throughout my endless search for inspiration, I came across storytellers who are able to craft stories that are unbelievably grandiose, yet remain relatable to the tiniest details. One of them is Hayao Miyazaki, legendary director and founder of Studio Ghibli. Miyazaki has arguably created the most influential stories over the past 40 years, and every one of them provides the immersive experience like I described. However, times have changed in the animation industry. With the increasing demand, tighter deadlines and corporate watchdogs holding the strings in every production, the magic of storytelling is at risk. Studio Ghibli's influence is also dwindling since the pseudo-retirement of Hayao Miyazaki. His son, Goro Miyazaki, despite the disappointment of his father, keeps making bold moves in order to adapt to the evolving animation landscape. But his attempts clearly miss the mark in terms of the brilliant design his father is known for. So I ask myself, who will carry the mantle of brilliant imagination to inspire the next generation of storytellers? A decade ago, an animator called Hiro Masayunobayashi rose to the ranks at Studio Ghibli with his debut film called Arietti. The success of this film earned Yonobayashi the title of youngest director for feature films at Studio Ghibli. Only a couple years later in 2014, Yonobayashi released one of Ghibli's most heart-wrenching films, which earned him a nomination for an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. This film is called Amore no Mani, adapted from the book When Mani Was There, written by Joe G. Robinson. Is Amore no Mani at last a film that will change the shape of the animation industry? Short answer, hell no. Omori no Mari pales in comparison to its older sibling Arietti, and I find it strange that Omori no Mari was pushed into obscurity despite its qualities. Omori no Mari touches on controversial subjects, such as the destructive nature of psychological trauma. Let's take a look at the synopsis and narrative themes of the film to illustrate this. On the surface, I would say that Omori no Mari is about an introverted girl called Anna struggling to find self-acceptance. Since the beginning of the film, Anna is seen alone, immersed into drawing to pass the time instead of interacting with other children. Anna is internally convinced that she lives only as a burden and that her foster parents pretend to care about her. This conviction is strongly expressed early in the film, where Anna goes to a doctor due to an asthma attack, seemingly costing her foster parents a lot of money. Loneliness seems to be the first major theme we are confronted by as viewers. Anna suffers from loneliness, perhaps even isolation, because she fails to connect with other people. This sounds rather odd, doesn't it? I mean, aren't children usually portrayed as beacons of joy and innocence? Well, during the story we find out that Anna's parents died in a car accident when she was only a toddler. She was handed off to strangers who she was supposed to call mom and dad. Despite the helplessness and misfortune of the situation, Anna directed all blame towards herself, leading her on track to self-loathing, anxiety and depression. At such a young age, the psychological trauma that resulted from these events might have severely impacted her capacity to form emotional bonds with people. Anna sent her relatives in the seaside town in the hope that the clean air might change her health conditions. As she wanders outside to explore her surroundings, Anna discovers an abandoned mansion known as the Marsh House. After brief explorations, she finds out that the residence isn't as abandoned as it appears to be, as she runs into a mysterious blonde girl called Marnie. Marnie's energetic and open demeanor slowly begins to draw Anna out of her shell, but it seems there's more to Marnie than meets the eye. As she and Anna get to know more about each other's lives, the pair come to realize that they are more alike than expected, creating a deep bond between them. This connection becomes a major clue to the mystery behind Marnie's identity, and Anna is determined to find out. Regarding the theme of loneliness, let us not forget about the other side of the coin, which we now discovered, Marnie. Without spoiling too much about her, one point the story reveals is that she is lonely because her parents are always traveling abroad for work, leaving her behind with the caretakers. To Marnie's misfortune, these caretakers actually abuse her on a daily basis. Marnie is often trapped in a room at the mansion, unable to make any connections with other people, and thus feeling completely isolated. This marks another, much darker and subtle theme of the film, abuse. Anna and Marnie are the protagonists that find themselves in similar circumstances, both narratively and thematically. I think this is the driving force that causes them to form a unique, quite ethereal relationship over the duration of the film. For example, the conflicts Marnie experiences during the story draw parallel to Anna's suppressed feelings and emotions. Ultimately, 
It is these experiences that form the building blocks for Anna's revelation near the end of the film, as she learns to accept her inner feelings and begins to form bonds with the people around her. The relationship between Anna and Martin thus leads to a thematic conclusion, self-discovery. Blending themes throughout the narrative is very common in Ghibli films. Such stories stimulate a sensation of nostalgia deep within the hearts of viewers, especially those who are increasingly disillusioned by the reality of daily life. Ghibli films blend to dark, realistic themes such as war and depression, to light-hearted ones like the joy of youth and family. This is why there are many ways to interpret any Ghibli film, and this versatility is what allows the studio to reach a broad audience. In my opinion, this is also precisely why Ghibli films are no mere films. They are timeless experiences that offer a sanctuary for those who wish to reflect on the childlike innocence and imagination. Surrealism is a visual motif that I've noticed throughout most of Ghibli's films and is used to express the aforementioned Ghibli formula. It works well especially in character dramas, because of the freedom granted to visually reflect the character's state of mind. Amore no Mari's narrative plays out from Anna's perspective. In her early childhood, before the main story actually takes place, Anna was conditioned to dissociate herself from reality. Therefore, the film feels and looks quite dreamlike right from the start. Look closely at the way Anna carries herself, a stoic facial expression, held away from other people, and reacting flustered or indifferent when they approach her. Another example is how Anna's perception of the Marsh House seems to differ from reality. In Anna's perspective, the Marsh House is shrouded in mystery, almost emitting a sense of magic. To her, it seems like this piece of history just stopped its track in time, getting overgrown with all kinds of nature. But then, reality kicks in. I find that Anna is a rather unique character, in the sense that her story arc differs from how characters are usually developed in Ghibli films. Take the protagonist Kiki from Studio Ghibli's Kiki's Delivery Service, who struggles with similar troubles as Anna does. Kiki is introduced as happy, curious and eager, typical traits for most innocent children. In her story we see how this demeanor is contrasted to the reality of adulthood as she enters the big city life, and here Kiki learns what it means to grow up. Anna, however, is introduced as jaded, anxious and avoidant. Her story arc takes an inverted approach in comparison to Kiki's. Rather than being disillusioned by society and reaching a true sense of self, Anna retreats to her rural area and regains typical childlike traits that were lost in her early childhood. The existential question that looms in her mind is, how do I become a child again? Perhaps this question should be the core philosophy for Studio Ghibli's future work. We might have to remind ourselves of her past more often, not about the mistakes and regrets, but the joyous moments of youth that shaped us and the people we are now, deep within, and about the people around us as we grew up, family, friends, random strangers who made a small difference in how you think and see the world. It's quite easy to forget these things as you grow older, so ask yourself honestly, how do I become a child again? The Ghibli formula might have dated compared to the current anime landscape or storytelling in general. Our society is digitized and even human imagination might become ultimate for even faster media consumption. Or maybe it's just because mental illness is still stigmatized, forming a sensitive point of discussion, especially regarding children. Who really knows what goes on behind the scenes at Ghibli, the animation industry, or society itself? Therefore, regarding this video, I merely wish to celebrate Omori no Mani for what it is, a truly moving piece of art that should stand proudly among Ghibli's greatest works. Whenever someone asks me to recommend an anime film, I will mention Studio Ghibli, a titan holding the animation industry to an ideal with sheer humanity at its core for storytelling. Some of you might remember Studio Ghibli and ask, ah, did they make Spirited Away? Yeah, they did, but I would advise you to look further. Look past Miyazaki's glory, and there you will find a shimmering light. Approach and discover that this will be none other than Hiro Masayo Nobayashi's Amore no Mani, Studio Ghibli's Sleeping Giant. So I left home, I packed up and